Hello and you're very welcome to The Contact Book, the show where we look back at the life and times of our guests with a little bit of help from those who know them best as we navigate the highs and some of the lows of their lives. We all have access to their contact book and we're calling up those who lived through some of the experiences with them. It's awkward, it's endearing in equal measure and the truth behind all those tales will be revealed, embellished and of course enjoyed by all. You're very welcome to The Contact Book. Now, we have a very, very special guest for you this time, a- an absolute legend of the game. I know that term is bandied around quite a lot, but I think this one's applicable. Uh, he led England in 59 of his 72 caps after being named captain at just 22 years of age, winning three Grand Slams in 91, 92 and 95. And maybe, uh, well, a less celebrated fact, they were beaten finalists in the 1991 Rugby World Cup. He is talked about still in great tones because of the impact he had on the game in so many ways. I'm delighted to welcome to the contact book, Will Carling. Will, how are you? I'm very good, Craig. You? I'm great. Yeah, I'm great. Gosh, it doesn't I'm seem that nervous. Long. Are you? Because yes. w- w- you just you're delving deep into your past, not loving yes. that? <laughs> no, because there's, there's there's a lot that shouldn't be coming out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's the fact you're not in control of what what comes exactly. out. It's just, it's a real yeah. test of friendship. This it really is. It really is. But uh, look, fair play to you. You've been very open. So thanks for letting us in. How's life with you? What what's going on with you these days? It's very good. It's dominated by family. You know, I suppose when when you've got that many kids and and the, the age range is uh, is interesting. So. It's brilliant, and with all the the lockdowns and the, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it it's kept us all going. Actually, see, seeing uh, so much of each other, but um, and business, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff on on the business, and every now and again, I wander in and and see the England guys and and make coffee for them. I think, but that seems to be kind of the theme of things. You're making coffee for the England boys, and you seem to be a stable hand at home. According to your Instagram, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, clearing up after horses. So. Um, it's been an interesting time, hasn't it? But it's been one of those bits where you just think, actually, you get you get to spend time doing stuff that you you didn't get to spend time on before. See, I always presumed you were all, you always have a goal, just from from knowing you, I guess, and from seeing what you did as a player. And there's always a, a new thing you're striving for. Does that does that slow down? Do you think as you get older? Yeah, it does. And I think consciously you try and think, as you know, family grow up so quickly, and that you think I need to enjoy the time that they've been around because they're, they're up and gone and it's their lives. And you suddenly you're thinking, wow, you know, wh- where did that go? So I think that's helped sometimes make you just sit down and enjoy it rather than, you know, what is the challenge that you're, you know, you're obsessed with next. I mean, your family are young enough probably not to remember what happened in, in, you know, the nineties and uh, what you did with England. Do they, I mean, do they ever ask you about it? Are they interested? <laughs> well, there's two. It's like there's the, there's a true story that the the younger boys, one of them when he was about nine, I think, he just looked at me and, and Jack, who's the youngest, was about seven, and he went, "My mate's dad said you used to play for England," <laughs> and uh, and I looked at him and I said, "Well, pff, doesn't matter, does it?" You know, and he just looked at me, "Did you?" And I went, "Well, it, it, I did or didn't. Doesn't matter, does it? I'm your dad. Sort of. That's that's it, isn't it?" I'm, and uh, so eventually they sort of said, look, I did, but it was a long time ago. And which was funny. And then and, and then Mimi, who's who's the youngest, God, this must have been like a year ago, we're having dinner and I was talking to a mate, they were around for dinner. And I said, oh, you know, we we're talking about something to do with rugby. And I said, I loved it. And she went, hang on, Dad. She goes, you loved rugby? And I said, yeah, I did. Why? She goes, well, I didn't think you liked it at all. And I said, I looked at her, I went, why do you think that? She goes, because you never talk about it. And saying that, we're going to look back a little bit now, if you don't mind, because it was interesting. <laughs> I always saw you as this kind of rather dashing, kind of England centre, world at your feet, uh, former army officer, posh schools. And then when I delve a little bit deeper and, you know, your grandfather being a butcher and you being quite defensive of the fact that, that he was a butcher and not loving the snobbery that existed around you, you seem to be kind of caught between two little worlds a bit when you were when you were younger, is that the case? Yeah, I think it was. I think uh, you know the, the army out of necessity, and my dad was in the army. is very hierarchical and and all that. And I um, I suppose early on, you know, you get to meet people and you sort of think, oh, they're, they're good people. You know, they're, they're good fun. And then someone tells you that, oh, well, you know, they're a soldier, they're an officer, and and you should mix with with officers. Not so, and you're like, what's that going to? You know, it's 
they're a good person and, and there's a lot of not so good people there. So the whole snobbery bit, and I think, you know, English society didn't really, didn't resonate too well with me. I like people. If you like a person, I don't, you know, that's the bit. I don't care what your accent is or, or where you're from. It's, you're a good guy, good person, good woman. It's so, I, yeah, I had a bit of an issue with that. It's funny, isn't it? For me, you were, and this is not an excuse, you were 22 and you were made captain and no one talked to me about the media. You just were rolled out for your first press conference <laughs> and no one advises you. That was it. Just sat in the room. You're pretty immature. You're quite defensive. This is your, this is your dream. And, and suddenly this is, this is your team and you want to look after them. And so you, you get a bit of a head on with, with the media. And I think you just, you get portrayed in a certain way. And obviously I was portrayed as, you know, public school army officer I mean it's all there it's it's cliche English tick tick it's perfect isn't it and it's a great story and actually once once it starts rolling you you know this better than me it's pretty hard to stop it unless you're going to make a big effort and open up and talk about how you really are and I geez I, I'm and at 22 I wasn't that kind of guy I wasn't going to let someone in ultimately you're pretty shy you're, you're pretty quiet and you just don't want to uh to make yourself vulnerable to people and it's and so this this image and I sp- you know, you, I look back and you sort of, when you run out on a rugby pitch, you can look, you know, you can walk around and, and you've got to, my view was as captain, you, you've got to show confidence. You know, we're, we're here to win. So everyone would look and think, wow, look at that arrogant. And, but that's on a rugby pitch and that's you trying to, you know, trying to lead and, and do the bits you need to do. You walk off the pitch. No one ever sort of can quite conceive that you're a very different person. What were you really like in school, though? This is where we're going to delve into the contact book for the first time, if you don't mind, because we need an old school pal. So <laughs> in your contact book, there's a chap called Alex Hambly. Uh. <laughs> you sound hugely <laughs> excited about that name. <laughs> <laughs> Alex was in school with you in, where was he, in Sedberg with you? Is that Yeah. Where, yeah. yeah. Sedberg. I think we should call Alex. So let's get Alex on the line, because this is when the real truth comes out. Oh, he's right. These are nervous moments. Oh, hello. Hello, Alex. There's it's nothing great. about me that's going to make you nervous, although <laughs> Carling should be a bit worried. <laughs> okay, Alex, you've, you've copped on to why I'm ringing. Excellent. What was he like uh, back, <laughs> in, back in school, Alex? What kind All of right. guy was Will? Yeah, okay. Because of the rugby, he arrived with a big reputation for rugby. You know, we, we knew he was coming from wh- whichever prep school he was at. And I, I think that made him quite shy, actually. So I think when he arrived, because he had a bit of a people were watching him, he was quite a shy guy quite quiet but obviously people were it, said there was a, I mean may have explained this to you said there was a massive rugby school so people were watching him and I think when he arrived he was immediately put into the older age groups to play rugby and that makes you very self-conscious so actually you, you become quite a quiet guy and then the other thing that people really didn't appreciate was he arrived as an art scholar I don't know if he's told you that no you know he came in as a sort of good rugby good at art smart bright you know he was a presence everyone knew he was there but he was not uh, arrogant with it the art was something I think he probably kept quite quiet, but some of us that knew him well knew knew about that. You could see his drawings and things. He was he was pretty talented. Do you still paint now or draw now? Well, I draw every now and again, yeah. And uh, for me, it's yeah, sketching and maybe inks. But I I love drawing or always have. Do you ever tell people about how your artistic skills led to all the forgery of those? England rugby shirts, or is that something you don't talk about? I've always thought that that was done for the with the best of intentions. You know, the fact that I, I I can forge signatures. It wasn't just shirts. I can tell you. <laughs> Here's a Saturday afternoon. So we lived in a house in London together when he was captain, and he'd be always out Saturday night. And then it's three o'clock in the afternoon. You just hear sort of shit. I promised a um, an England signed England Grand Slam shirt. Uh, and he would say to me, Al, can you run down to the sports shop, buy an England shirt, ideally with number 13 on the back, bring it back here. And then he'd forge all the autographs. They were brilliant. I mean, they were probably better than if they guys had done it. Put it in a um, thing and off you'd go to his... And you say, how much did that sell for? Al, but actually, that's probably a good dam- Just work. think of the it's damage you've just done. Because it was forged. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, look, it's great hearing about this stuff, Alex. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> It's no, thank helpful. you, Al. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Uh, <laughs> how did you go from you know schoolboy star to to playing for your country to captain in England? What was that? What was that journey? Well, yeah. So, so I played for for sort of England schools. Then then went off travelling the a classic thing, and then got to Durham. And I remember getting to Durham University, and you go from schoolboy rugby, which is very polite, you know, it's very English. And suddenly we were playing men's rugby, and we were playing concert and Bladen, places like that up in the northeast. 
And a lot of these guys were unemployed miners and the students come along and it was just a great chance for them to kick the hell out of students and relieve a bit of tension. So most of the time it was raining. As a fullback, you got no ball, but you just got everything kicked out of you week in, week out. And I do remember months into this thinking, I'm not sure I want to play this game. You know, what? where's the fun in this? But I, I tell you, I suppose it just, it hardened you up a bit. You, you learned how to take a good kicking. And then things just somehow, you know, just started to progress, played county, played for the north of England in those days. And I was very lucky. There's a guy, Jeff Cook, who ended up managing England, picked me for the north. And it went from there, really. Talk to me about England captaincy. So it's 1988, you're age 22, and you've been made captain of England. Yeah. England's youngest ever captain. When you, I mean, it's just, I think Brian O'Driscoll is probably the only one who captained his country at, at such a young age. It's crazy young when you think back. And I guess when you look at your own kids and you think, <laughs> would they manage something with that responsibility at such, at such a young age? What was it like to get that phone call? How, how did it play out? We had toured Australia and I had played. We lost both tests, came back, and then we were obviously playing them in, in November. And I'd gone home, sort of well-documented, sort of, you know, gone home to my parents and my mum rang me and said, uh, sort of not rang me, when I walked through the door, I said, oh, by the way, Jeff Cook rang for you. You need to ring him back, which meant, in my mind, you were getting dropped. Because if you had been in the test team and there was a there was a match coming up and Jeff spoke to you, that meant you were being dropped. So I sat in the kitchen and, and sort of went over the games in the summer, thought, oh, you know, I know it wasn't great, but... Pfft, I didn't think I was that bad and I wonder who he's going to pick instead. And eventually, you know, I thought, oh, well, I've got to ring him. And he sort of went through that, sort of did the thing of, you know, I want to talk to all the people who played the last test. And then I said, oh, that's very kind of you, Jeff. And then he said, no, not you, Will. And I said, oh, okay. And I just remember him saying, I, I said, so, you know, what have you rung for, Jeff? He said, I want to know if you'll captain the team. And I just laughed because he's a Yorkshireman. You know, he's not known for his humour. And there was no laugh. And I sort of went, that's very good, Jeff. No, what do you want? And um, he went, I want to know if you're Captain England. And I'll always remember my brother was in the kitchen and he was obviously just looking at me going, what, you know, you're dropped. And so I, there was a piece of paper, there was one of those post-it notes and I got a pen and just put, I'm Captain and held it up to him. And he just said something that with the second word was off. You know, and, and that was the reaction of most people. And you just sort of put the phone down and, because actually, what you know, I, I never had a dream of captaining England. I, my dream was playing. And I was still trying to get used to being in a team with Winterbottom and Underwood, guys that I had watched when I was at school. And they're still, you know, they're my heroes. And and suddenly someone said, right, you're you're captain. It's incredible to think you, you thought you were about to be dropped and next thing you're captain <laughs> of England. I mean, they're just so inversely proportional worlds you lived in for those 30 seconds. I mean, it's it's crazy stuff. And and you, you really didn't think you were a captaincy material at that stage? He, no, well, if you think, so it was so long ago, we used to have final trials. And so in, in the probables was Halliday and a guy called Buckton. And I was in the possibles with a guy called Kevin Sims. Now, both Halliday and Buckton got injured. So I only got picked for my first cap with Kevin Sims because those two got injured. And that was seven months before. So you're thinking, I only got my break because of injuries. That's quite a, a turnaround. And four or five years ago, I went up, Lisa's mum lives up in Yorkshire, and we were going up to pick her up. And I said, listen, we're, we're going to see Jeff Cook. And she said, why? I said, because I've ne never asked him why he made me captain. <laughs> she went, oh, okay. You could tell she was really thrilled. And so the whole way up, she says, you know, there's me. I'm sort of, I'm thinking, I wonder what he's going to say. He's, you know, what was it he saw in me? And all these sort of bits and pieces. And then we get to the pub and Jeff, the classic Yorkshire, eventually I sort of go, Jeff, I always wanted to ask why. And he just looked at me. He was a classic. He just went, why what, Will? And I'm like, oh, you git. You know, uh, <laughs> I said, why did you make me captain? I sort of, you know, braced myself for all these you know, complimentary bits and pieces. And he went, well, if you remember that first season, we had four guys captain and we were making a bit of a mess of it. And I remember saying to Roger Utley, we've probably got one roll of the dice left and that was you. And I went, oh, great. Uh, <laughs> he just looked, I remember him looking me straight in the eye and there was a little smile on his lips. It was like, I'm not going to tell you what you want, you know, yeah. what you've come here for. I'm just not going to do that. And quite rightly. And Lisa said, I was much quieter on the way home. <laughs> I mean, I'm just glad. I'm glad he didn't say that to you when you were a when you were a 22 year old. Though, would have oh, no. completely he, he was good. It was brilliant. Um, I'm just wondering. You mentioned some of the the names and uh, you know, that that were on that team at that stage, and you know, been there a long time, senior members of that team, and amongst them, uh, of course, Brian Moore. And Brian is a, a heck of a character, a heck of a player he was too. 
I just want to get his take on you, <laughs> this young dashing private schoolboy becoming captain of England. So I know Brian's in your phone somewhere. Mm. I know you've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So let's give Brian Moore a call. Always a complete lottery whether you get Moro uh, when you try and ring him, as you well know. Uh, he doesn't do WhatsApp. I doubt he texts. And he'll only no. sometimes answer his phone. He only texts when he needs something. <laughs> it might be a true Plus. ring. Hey, Morrow, hi, it's Craig Doyle here on the contact book. Hello, Craig. I got Will Carlin on the phone with me here. We're just uh, we're chatting about um, the England yes, days. Well. We'd love to get your take on it. How's life yeah. with you, Morrow? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm bells the way in Dubai. So I've got four. four <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I have no idea how she works so hard. She, her capacity for work is astonishing. I, I just don't know. How to do this. So <laughs> I should tell everyone you are talking about Belinda, your wife. She's off working on the golf in Dubai. And how old are the girls now? The twins are they two, three? Twins, four years old, and then a twelve-year-old who thinks he's eighteen, and a nineteen-year-old who's a nineteen-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. They're not strong-minded, are they, Maura? I don't know. Um, <laughs> No, I don't know where that came no. from. <laughs> I just, to be Jesus a fly. <laughs> I tell you today, right, they're supposed to have different size shorts. I know they have, but I've washing up, so I, I couldn't find them. So one of them, have you seen Kez, the film Kez? Yes. yes. You know when he borrows those shorts to play in goal and the massive? <laughs> of Brian Glover, see? They don't fit, sir. We could get him then. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but they don't. So they fit. So get him. You look like that. It was, I, I was ashamed. But I, <laughs> I could see all the mothers looking at what, What's going on? Do they do my hair? Yeah. I've combed my hair for 25 years. What, what do I know about combing hair? <laughs> Excellent. Good to see. You. So good family holiday anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good to see you. Yeah, talk, yeah. Um. God. Oh, did, you, did you remember to feed them? You know you got to feed children, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I know it's feeding, it's fine, feeding, but they don't they don't let off on that. <laughs> oh dear. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, this sounds like the perfect time to ask you, what did you think of Will Carlin when he arrived on the England team? <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> well, look, I, I didn't. Know, no one knew much about him, to be honest. Some uh, some for Queens and so on. The, the fact is, I mean, he came, you know, as the reputation and the, the newest captain, and, it, and I, you know, I have to admit, I thought I could be captain, be captain of England students, England B, uh, there were other people senior to me as well. Yeah, and it must have been hard for him. But, um, because people were a bit put out. It, not an easy situation to be in, I would have thought. Huh. And I guess he, you felt like he was a world away from you, this uh, seemingly posh kind of private school boy, you, you know? Uh, well, no, I mean, the thing is, you've got to remember, the teams are made up of very different people, you know, from from doctors to, to furniture makers and, and on all sorts. So uh, I don't think that was an issue particularly. Did, did you feel the captaincy, you know, was something in your destiny at that stage? Uh, not in destiny, no, I hope. Because as I said, I kept hearing students in the B. Uh, it wasn't an assumption. I would like to have done. Obviously, everyone would like to have done. Whether I'd been any good is a, a completely different matter, actually. Will, what was it like? I mean, because, you know, we know what Bride's like. He's, 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 a, he's a big character. And my word, he was he, he was terrifying for the opposition on the pitch. What was it like going into the dressing room with the likes of Moro there? He was one of those guys, Craig. So, so you'd stand up. And if at the rare occasions that I thought, oh, this is what we need to do, you'd go, right, guys, I think we need to do this. And the first person you'd hear was, Why? And it would be Brian. And I'd look at him and part of me would think, oh, for God's sake. And then part of you would think, yeah, you've got to have a very good reason as to why we're doing this because he's bright, he's eloquent, all that sort of stuff. So it was perfect because you got challenged on everything and people weren't just going to do what you wanted them to do. There had to be a bloody good reason for it. I don't think I was obtuse in a way like Dean Richards <laughs> was. Dean would just object for the sake of it. Just to, to put something into the pot, really, and have a bit of a laugh. And it wasn't that with me. I did, yeah, I did want to know why. You've got to remember, you have people there who, you know, I remember talking to Wade Dooley. You, he said, you try telling someone the son's died. You know, I, it just took me back a bit. He said, well, I have done that. You know, I do similar things most weeks. You've really hit on something there. Wade Dooley, of course, a, a policeman. You were in the legal world. Everyone had everyone had these careers. As professionalism was beginning to kind of creep in, it was a, it was a, just a different time for rugby, wasn't it? Like today, it's not their fault because it's a pro game. They can't do it. You, you know, your experience leads you to to all sorts of things. And I, you know, I was in a profession where you were asked for facts, you were demanded facts, your arguments had to be good. Otherwise, you got thrown out of court. And you, you know, and it was embarrassing, and you didn't make money, and so on. So you know, I just carried on. Uh, it's the way the way it was. 
And do you know what? People always you say to me, you know, they play club rugby or for, for local sides and they go, I bet it's really different with England. And you go, do you know what? The characters are the same. And, and you get on the coach to go to training and more the forwards would all be at the back. And if they had something on you, you used to get it. And they would absolutely rip you to pieces. And the, the saving grace for most of my career was that we had a player called Dowie Morris, who <laughs> would always save you. You'd be getting it from everyone. And then Dowie would go over the top and say something that was even more stupid and everything would suddenly just focus on him. I'm pretty sure Dowie tells an after-dinner story. I'm pretty sure quite a few players. And don't be offended, Will. Um, Is this the one about him being punched? Yeah, can you tell the story, Brian, and tell me if it's true or not? Will goes into a rock, go and whack him, and Will's a bit put out by this. Now, Will calling, I, I said, but England, Princess Di, you can't do that. So he goes to the referee and says, referee, did you see that? Someone just punched me. And he said, well, Will, to be fair... I, I can't do anything, can I? I didn't see it. And one of the opposition, out the corner of his mouth, walked past the referee slowly and said, Sir, it could have been any one of 29. And then the referee thought yeah. about it for a while and said, Actually, make it 30. Add me in. <laughs> no, no it, it didn't happen, but it, but it could have done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's about right. It's it's one of the great stories. That Tell me it happened. No, sadly, it didn't. You should work out, Craig. Will went into a ruck. When did that ever happen? Do you know what I mean? It's like, uh, no. Although the true story about Dowie, which Mora will testify, is when we got to meet Nelson Mandela before a test match, you, you know, some people were going to get the chance to ask him something. Dowie actually asked him <laughs> if there were tax discs on cars in South Africa. <laughs> he looked around at his sort of security guys and everyone was looking at him like, what? what? Um, it was just one of those moments where you looked at Dowie and I remember after, what was the most frightening bit? We, we managed to win the game and I remember in the change room I was lying around and suddenly I remembered it. I went, Dowie, what on earth was that? And he went, oh, he said, I know I panicked. It was the first thing that came into my mind. He was one of my personal political heroes, Mandela. I wanted to speak to him just under any pretext because he was a great yeah. man, one of my heroes. And I was thinking, can I ask him about his time on Robben Island? No, that's too long. Yeah. Can I ask him about how he's going to satisfy the unrealistic economic expectations of the Black Rangers? No, not too long. And then Morris <laughs> pipes up. Do you have road back? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> At least it was a yes or no answer. <laughs> but do they? I, mean, I guess they no, do. We, we never found out. <laughs> Before we let you go, I always thought, you know, during your playing days, you two didn't like each other. But obviously, there's a bit of love between you all and uh, a good friendship. But what, no, what are your I, reflections? I no, I'll tell you what it was. There was an antipathy out of circumstance and one of you. If Jeff Cook had come and said, he's captain because of this, this, and this, and this, you could have disagreed, but that didn't happen. It was sort of like, there you are, get on with it. Oh, great, okay. Uh, one thing that as I've got older, I hope I've got a bit more forgiving and a bit more understanding, because I, I understand all my flaws a bit better, and therefore I understand why other people have them, and that it's normal, and so on. And yeah, we get on better now, because there's perspective, there's experience, life experience, things have happened to both of us, some good, some bad. But I tell you what, it is a pity we didn't have that, we didn't have that at the time, because I think it would have been a better relationship, and the team would have got more out of it. That was a battle it didn't need in the background. And... The thing is, with Will, I, I genuinely believe that team could have been captained by a lot of people as well. But Will did a really good job. And at the, right, and the time when rugby was emerging into the back pages, front pages, mill pages, he was a sort of face and so on. And he handled that very well. And I think people give captains too much credit when people win and too much stick when they lose. And the, the, I, think the, I think the disappointing thing for me, whenever you hear about England 15's, you know, best of all year, Will's name didn't come up. And I think it obscured the fact that he was a really, really good player. And so, in many ways, I regret a lot of the times, you know, the, the bits of angst and whatever, the bits that worked, the bits that didn't. I don't think they could have been better because I was young and he was young and we were stupid uh, in lots of ways. And I was emotionally retired. So, that's my overall reflection. It could have been better, but that was a two way thing. And after all, his win percentage, great and so on. And he was a very, very good player. Yeah, Sounds like Moro, peace has been made, though. Huh? Yeah, but Craig and, and Moro, you're right. Uh, there's way too much made of captaincy. We had a core of players who basically drove that team, and it certainly wasn't me. You know, when you look back, I know what you're saying, Moro, but actually, in a way, the sort of the friction, it drove both of us, it drove other people. It just, it, I think it's it's part of the chemistry, wasn't it? 
Yeah, I, I think you could still have elements of it without the without yeah. the, the the negative ones. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know the overall memories are positive and very good. So good. what else you take out of that? I don't know how much more you can ask for. And and yeah. you know the key words there. You know you were good and it was fine. For Morrow, that's a huge compliment, Will. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, Morrow, thanks so much. You better. You you got some washing to that's do. That's okay, guys. Yeah. London, look, th- great, great talking to you, Morrow. Take care of yourself. All the best. Cheers, I've, got to tidy up, I've got to tidy up the uh, Paw Patrol toys now. Cheers, Morrow. I'm really fixed here. Well, uh, I want to talk World Cups. Uh, first of all, I want to yeah. talk quickly about 91 and losing the final and your reaction yeah. to losing the final. What did you do with your medal? I think my medal is somewhere in the loft with everything else, but I'm not sure. Are you sure uh, it's not at the bottom of the Thames? No, no, no. I never, I never, I think Mora threw his away. I didn't, but then I'm not a hoarder of memorabilia. I haven't kept lots of stuff. So I think it's around, but I'm, I'm not, I certainly didn't have a fit of, I want to throw this away. Because Moro did, yeah. I thought maybe you all did it together. Moro threw his one into, no. the, into the Thames in anger. Uh, you know, after that World Cup, losing in that final, uh, how was it? Well, Moro is, is one of the guys, and, and I remember Peter Winterbottom and I and Moro were, were talking about it. Jeez, this was probably only about a year ago. And I was saying to Moro, people tend to forget is that we had toured Australia that summer. We had played the style of rugby we played in the Six Nations, when we, the Five Nations as it was then when we won it, and they whacked us 40 points to 15. And everyone forgets that. So they think, God, England got to the final and just decided to change the style of rugby for the sake of it, because David Campisi had said some stuff in the press. And you think, no, much as I admired Campo as a, as a player... <laughs> You know, I wouldn't have ever listened to his tactical approach. We just sat there, a member of the week of the final, thinking, right, we got whacked three months ago, four months ago. We need to do some some things differently. The, the honest truth is we went out and we played a more fluid game. And if I had been a really good tactical captain, we would have tightened up. For some reason, our forwards were just absolutely immense that day. And we should have probably played more to that strength and therefore... That was one of the issues for me. I remember afterwards thinking we made enough opportunities, bizarrely, to win that game. We just weren't precise enough to take them. They made one. They took it. And I don't, it's not an excuse for me, Craig. I look back and think if we had played that team 10 times, they would have beaten us more than we would have beaten them. They were a better right. team than us. And that's my honest assessment of it, much as it hurts. Well, let's roll on to 1995 in the World Cup. Slow old start to the tournament. Got a bit of form, won the group games. Then you knock out Australia in the quarterfinals. Rob Andrew gets a drop goal. All done. So you're set up to play New Zealand in the semis. Yeah. And when you talk to players who played in this game, a game you lost, most of them are not kind of... <sighs> They don't seem in pain. They seem in awe of the guy who just dismantled you that day, who was Jonah Lomu. And it was the day that Jonah Lomu really announced himself on the world stage. So I want to talk about that game against New Zealand, about Jonah Lomu. To do that, though, we need to bring in Tony Underwood. Poor old Tony's always dragged out when it comes to that 1995 semi-final against New Zealand because, you know, he himself and Mike Cat, well, they were were ran over, basically, by Jonah Lomu. So let's give Tony a bit of a buzz here. Hopefully he answers. He's so tired talking about this, I'm sure. Hey, Tony. Hello. Hi, Tony. It's, it's Craig here. How are you? I got Will on the phone. You're on the contact book. Guess what we're talking about? Let me guess. Wouldn't be tap tackling I, I, Mr. Lomi because you got near him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Tony, I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> let's, get, let's get the elephant out of the room straight away, Will, shall we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Tony, what what are your memories of that day? They were recently played out. Uh, BT Sport showed a lovely little film where they looked back at that game using Jonah Loma's words, and it was actually it was great to watch. And and his view before that game, Tony he he was being hidden he was hidden away in hotels. I think New Zealand knew that he was this amazing player that was about to burst onto the world stage. They were trying to protect him. And I don't know, did you know what was coming your way? Well, I think they were doing the same with me, weren't they? Will didn't you lock me in a room and feed me some lines and say let let me go against the boy? <laughs> but uh, no. <laughs> I think uh, just uh, we'd, we'd seen a couple of the games, obviously, and had had an idea what was coming. But, uh, you know, I think we were all in a bit of shock, the actual reality of it all starting from when you see the guy for the first time. And obviously, I had the uh, pleasure of lining up against him in the in the Haka. 
So um, a lot of just wait things just didn't go our way that day, I think. Uh, um, and in the first 5, 10, 15 minutes, I think it was pretty clear that wasn't going to be our day. One of the points he makes, Jonah, when he reflected on the game was the fact that just during the hacker, Will, I don't know if you remember this, uh, Tony said, I'm going to take him down by winking at him. <laughs> Bad move. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I don't know if Tony remembers. We, we, we played Australia the week before, and I think Rob had put a kick up, and Tony and I had chased it. And I think Tony had hit, it wasn't Campo, was it? I'm trying to think who else was. You, you'd hit him early, and you got penalised, Tony. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. And you, yeah, and you picked yeah, him up yeah. off the ground and said, sorry, which was very English. <laughs> and all I can say, so I can say, Craig, was I bollocked Tony like hell on walking back and just said, don't you ever, you know. So I think he was like, well, okay, well, I'll take on Jonah um, <laughs> a week later. But it was just like, um, uh, do you know what? And, and, and the weird thing is, I, I sadly, I remember sitting with him five years ago and we were watching... England, Fiji and Nadala, everyone was talking about how big Nadala was, you know, and and this, that and the other. And Jonah just said to me, do you know what, Will? Still not as big as me. And, yeah. <laughs> and when you think about how the game has progressed, the players, how much bigger, fitter, stronger, more skillful they are than they were in 95. But the still, he was and would still be today an unbelievably physical specimen out on the pitch that people would struggle to deal with. And that's how incredible he was. Tony, give everyone an idea of what it was like trying to stop Jonah Lomo in full flight. Well, I think really, I mean, people talk about this a lot. And unfortunately, poor Catty's are probably the one that has, my cat has a better idea of that because he unfortunately, uh, the, the 14 of us failed to do it well enough to, so that he was always the last man there. But the, the incredible thing about him, though, Craig, was the fact that you just, you just couldn't get near him um, if he had just had enough space on him, you know. The idea for me was just to be crowd him out and just get on as quickly as I could. Um, unfortunately, I, the times when the ball was coming to him and I, that might have happened and never got to him. So I'd never find out what it was like because he just had such an acceleration and a speed about him. That was the biggest startling thing about it. And uh, it, it just meant that that little bit of room that he created for himself, you know, he just had the strength to just palm off anyone that got anywhere near the guy. So. One of the few things that I used to think I did well was prepare myself as a captain for, for what might happen, lots of different scenarios. But I'd never, ever contemplated being under the posts after 20 minutes of a test match and having conceded four tries and the game is over. And I remember we were just standing there and it was just like, wow. But, and it's what Tony said, what I'm really proud of is that actually we played. We came back and we started playing and, and we did play well. And I think that was just something you, you walk away from that game and think we came across a, a phenomenal athlete who we didn't know how to deal with, but very few people did know how to deal with because that team, they as a team, they played well as well. And I think, you know, we did perform and it was just, a, a, it was a fairly historic day. What did you say to the team under the sticks? As the tries started raining in. Oh, do you know you what? Didn't I say don't anything. know. I don't, no. Oh, captain, my captain. <laughs> well, I think I, I, I certainly started by saying he's not my man, so it's not my problem. Um, I, do you know what? I think it was. Look, we're yeah. proud of wearing this shirt. I'm proud, and I'm proud of you. And let's go and do something that will make us proud. We're not just going to crumble here, guys. We've got to stand up and, and fight for each other, and, and we did. Great talking to you. Really good talking to you. And thanks for reflecting. Cheers, Tony. Really good uh, stuff. You take Cheers. care. Well, well done, mate. You take care. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Let's talk about the progression. You've come back from that World Cup. We know what's happened there. And um, this is when you really start landing yourself in trouble, Will. Never <laughs> has the term 57 old farts uh, been splattered across the, the front page. or needless to say, the back page of a newspaper before. But um, obviously the frustrations about rugby and the way it was going, obviously it was on the turn into professionalism. And uh, it just kind of got to you. And the big committees were beginning to wind you up a bit. And those famous words, 57 old farts. It was like a hand grenade, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I think we had uh, toured South Africa the year before when when it it got to a peak where the first game we were playing in, in Durban and their winger scored and flashed up on the score on the big sort of scoreboard electronic what his bonus was for scoring. And I remember just standing there looking, hey, you're bloody annoyed because they just scored against you. But secondly, it's like. <laughs> 
oh, a bonus payment in this great amateur game of ours. So we had an ongoing argument with the committee guys who were out there saying, listen, this is not an amateur game anymore. And we're asking for a level play field. It's quite obviously not a level playing field. And that was our frustration. So we were saying to them, you either enforce it as an amateur game across the globe, or you make sure that everyone is allowed to uh, to do the same things, because we want to be able to beat these people and have a fair chance of doing that. So that was the frustration. The actual, the 57 old farts, which was um, done with Greg Dyke, was just, I'd ne- I never intentionally said it. He just caught it on a microphone. The, the interview finished, and I remember taking my microphone off and turning it off and putting it on the table. And I got up and walked past him and past the camera, which was obviously over his shoulder. And I was just about to go out the door, and he said, come on, Will. Um, and I turned around, and he said, if the game goes professional, what do you think is going to happen? And I'd seen he'd taken his microphone off, but I didn't see that he'd left it on, on the table. And I just laughed at him. I said, I don't know, Greg. I said, but I suppose you don't need 57 old farts to run it if it does. And and left. So for me, when the press started ringing saying, you know, I can't believe you said this, I said, I didn't say it in an interview. And he'd just caught on his microphone, which for me is a bit of a shit trick. but I shouldn't have said it when there are microphones around. Give everyone an idea of the trouble it caused. <laughs> Well, I, you know, all hell let loose, obviously. And I was getting calls from all sorts of people. So this guy said, listen, you need to ring the president. They're all meeting uh, in the East India Club. This is serious, Will. I said, yeah, look, I get that. So I rang Dennis Easby and I got put through to this room and I said, Dennis, it's Will Carling. I said, listen, I'm ringing to apologise. I never meant this throwaway phrase to, to make it into, into the public domain. And he just said, well, you, you don't need to apologise. I said, oh, OK, Dennis. He said, because you're no longer England captain. And I said, oh, okay. And this was actually before the World Cup, Craig. And I sort of went, right. I said, can I ask you something, Dennis? He said, yes. I said, can I still go to the World Cup? He said, yes, of course you can. I said, oh, okay, fine. And I just put the phone down. And actually, do you know what? There was, I wasn't that fussed because I just, my dream was to, to lift the World Cup. And I didn't care whether I lifted that first or last. You know, you just want to lift the World Cup. So I was just like, oh, do you know, it's... And I'd, I'd had it for quite a while. It was just almost like, oh, well, they'd been after me for a long time. So it was yeah. just like, oh, well, one of those things will, you know, you got caught. So deal with it. Because I would imagine a lot of people out there felt the same about rugby committees. Yeah, I think the papers published the Twickenham sort of uh, numbers. Apparently the place went berserk. They had to turn off all the phones. <laughs> it just sort of went nuts. And obviously they but- started ringing players to say, will you captain? And they were just going, nope, Uh, which I didn't know. And it got to sort of Sunday evening. And I got a call from the guy who was my agent at the time, said, listen, they want to hold a press conference tomorrow at England training. And if you apologise to the president again, you'll get reinstated as captain. I said, well, I've apologised. He said, we'll do it again publicly. So I said, "Uh, yeah, sure. I always remember turning up to training at Marlow and I got out of the car and Martin Bayfield got out of the car. And he just looked at me and he said, is it true that they're reinstating you as captain? And I said, yes. He goes, oh, God. <laughs> he said, take that break up and you get reinstated as captain. He said, how much pain can a man deal with in one day? And, uh, and he just <laughs> laughed. And so we walked into the, uh, into the clubhouse together and it was just like, and then I had the most surreal press conference with Dennis Easby sitting there and, uh, and I had to publicly apologise again in front of all the media. And then he officially renamed me as England captain. Jack Ryle was the England coach from 95 to 97, so he had to, he had to put up with a lot of this and deal with a lot of this. Um, let's give Jack a call. I, 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 hope, uh, I hope he's there for us. I know he's uh, busy enjoying his retirement well into it at this stage, but let's give Jack Ryle a call. Would he officially have been an old fart if he was coach? No, no, no I don't think he's coach, but he was at no. the press conference. Oh, Hello? Hello? Hello, Jack. It's Craig Doyle here on the contact book. I have Will Carlin on the phone. And we're having a chat about his career, and we've got to 1995 and 57 old farts is where we're at, Jack. <laughs> and I thought it'd be a good time well, to bring a you good in. Place and... to start. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, uh, Jack, you were uh, obviously still England coach. That reverberates this... in my memory. <laughs> trying to deal with the fallout. Tell us about your reaction to it, your memory of it, and the fallout. Well, uh, Will rang me up and said he had a problem with the president, and I rang the president and asked him what was it all about. I asked the president if he could uh, hold on and let's think about it overnight. Will rang me early the next morning and said, uh, by the way, I've been relieved of the captaincy. I said, well, that shouldn't have happened because the president had said to me he and I would discuss it further before action was taken. So there we are, a rather dramatic fallout from uh, 
what Will thought was a lightweight remark, uh, humor, <laughs> but perhaps making a point. Did it surprise you Will said something like that? Well, Will was um, Will, and uh, <laughs> not backward in being positive. I almost said willful there, but I withdraw that comment straight away. <laughs> so, uh, but it was made of, you know, now and then, as you media guys will know, that the cameras are left rolling and et cetera, and that was the off-the-cuff remark Will made. So perhaps there was something registering in Will's mind and indeed uh, other players too, that uh, rugby union wasn't making the progress it should be making as regards how to treat players and the world around us at that time. Uh, professionalism was knocking on the door. Were they old farts, Jack? No, they were uh, each of them well-meaning people who devoted their lives to rugby union and had established themselves as uh, managers of the rugby union, as it were. Everybody underestimated the power, the drive towards professionalism led by the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Jack, Absolutely. thank you so much so, so much for your time, Jack. Really good to talk to you and good to hear you're well. All the best. Take care of yourself. You're welcome. All the thank best. you, Jack. Wow, Bye -bye. good to hear from Jack. Yeah, look, I know there were difficult times that followed Will. Well, it wasn't just rugby, was it, Will? There was a lot of rumours no. going around. Princess Diana's name was... There was a lot mentioned in the press about you and it just caught the media's attention and they were, they were going to town on you, weren't they? Yeah, and you ended up in in situations that you you shouldn't have been in. And I think when I look back at, at sort of, I rented a, not in my name, a flat in Covent Garden with underground parking. It didn't have a phone in it. My parents didn't even know where I, where I lived. And I lived there for a year and I never opened the curtains or blinds in case anyone looked in. And I got followed probably every day of my life for a year. And, I, and it's just a very, very strange, and it's a pretty horrible uh, experience. But you think stupidly doing things that, that you, you shouldn't do. And yeah, it was, like what, you know, my like life what, was, was a bit of a mess. Just, you know, you end up I, I, I make, making messes of, of relationships, you know, because you, you're sort of rudderless and, you, and you, you've lost your focus and, yet, you know, you don't behave well. And it's like, and, and, you know, and I didn't. Never intentionally or vindictively. I just think that was me. I just was in a bit of a mess. You're sort of like a, a car that you've lost a steering wheel and you're just careering all over the place. It, it, it wasn't very pleasant. You hid away, as you said, for a year. You didn't talk to many people. You had one close friend by the name of Andrew Har, who you lent on, and he helped you through it, but not many others. Can we give Andrew a call and, and let, let, let's get his take on, on this period? Because I'm sure he was just watching it unfold, thinking, oh, my word. This must be making you nervous. I would be nervous. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's see if Andrew's Anyone calling nervous. Andrew makes me nervous. <laughs> Hello, Hi. Andrew. Craig Doyle here in the contact Hi. book. I've got your pal, Will. We're talking through his life. We've done all the good bits and we, <laughs> we've come to you for <laughs> the tricky bits. That long. We've come to the yeah. point that he's, um, that he's locked away in a flat. Yeah. What are your recollections of that period? <laughs> Well, do you know, funnily enough, we just moved house being really boring. And I was going through all the sort of stuff and rubbish you keep and then discovered some letters, actually, which were really beautifully written by Will, which you will be surprised to hear all from that time. So if you'd asked me a week ago, what could I have remembered? It would have probably been fairly hazy, but actually it all came back to me in the last week. Wow, State I don't was... remember writing you letters. <laughs> I'll send them to you, Will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're yeah. not going to disclose the detail, but what was the general tone? I mean, I think the sentiment really was that obviously it was a challenging time for Will at that time. You know, we're sort of talking mid 90s and he and Julia hadn't been married that long and life was challenging and, and sort of rugby was still a key part of his life. And I think what sort of struck me at the time and afterwards is that it took quite a lot to do. You know, we're, we're generationally classic sort of guys who probably don't open up very much. And, and he'd never really done that before. And to be fair, I certainly hadn't. And I was thinking, you know, looking back that actually he did the hard bit. You know, I, I was the easy bit. I suppose I was a friend who was at the end of a phone or, or at the end of a letter to sort of reach out to. Uh, the hard bit was actually making the decision that actually you wanted to sort of share those thoughts and, and speak to someone. How bad was it, Andrew? How bad was it, Will? I mean, you're describing essentially a pretty heavy, depressive episode here, Will. Yeah, it's it, it was a fairly traumatic time because it was pretty high profile. Jeez, I, I look back and I remember sitting on a on a park bench talking to you for hours on the phone. I remember that. Yeah, um, yeah. It's bizarre, and you just sort of trying to work out what I was doing 
and uh, I hadn't really got much of a clue. And I think at the time, you know, what were you? You were sort of 30, were you? Late 20s, 30? Yeah, probably. And But you were, you know, right in the public eye. And, you know, I've never been in that position. But for anyone to be going through that sort of situation, but in the public eye, and there'd be lots of speculation about, you know, why your relationship was under strain, that's tough. I think, you know, as we all get older, those sort of conversations, I mean, fortunately, we don't have to have them very often. But those sort of conversations that we've learned as you go through life, you get a bit more experience, you go through the ups and downs of things that were you know they're easier to have now i think in your late 20s and in the public eye it's so much harder how worried were you andrew about will I wasn't worried you know will to be fair is has never lacked sort of confidence in himself so he was never going to be someone that was completely insecure he was someone that probably needed reassurance and probably needed someone to speak to about saying you know this is what i'm going through what do you think and will's default setting is to be you know a positive guy with a sort of a can do attitude on life so he wasn't himself. He wasn't the normal Will. But I wasn't it. I'd be sort of exaggerating and said I was worried about his underlying well-being. But he was clearly under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure at the time. So How worried were you, Will, about yourself? I'd, I'd never contemplated anything, you know, in terms of severe sort of depression and, and any... But I think you're just trying to think, I'm making a bit of a mess of relationship. I'm making a bit of a mess of, of important parts of my life. And I really need to get a handle on it and stop making a mess of those parts of my life because I don't enjoy it. For whatever people, you know, wrote at the time, I don't enjoy it. I I didn't enjoy, I don't enjoy causing pain. I don't enjoy emotional upheavals and and stuff like that for people. And so I think that's what, you know, Andrew was like, Christ, I, you know, I've got myself in a hell of a situation. I need to sort myself out. And and Andrew, you know, he's he's your classic Northern bloke of very few words. And I think what sort of summed up (laughs) His support was that the first time he met Lisa, we went up to stay with him and Juss and and we we were leaving and he just sort of took me aside and just went, Will. And I always remember, I went, yeah, he went, don't mess this one up for a change. And I went, okay. And uh, it's that sort of lovely, caring, eloquent way that he puts things that I think I've always loved about him. Well, Andrew, I'm delighted. You're you're a kind man. (laughs) But that was it. it was just, just don't mess this one up for a change. Well, yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad you took his advice, Will, because yes, it's oh, he's got a smile on his face and all seems to be going okay. So, well done to you, Andrew. <laughs> Not at all. It's a pleasure always. Yeah. And if he if he tries to if he tries to give you a thank you gift of an England rugby shirt, the signatures are fake. We've learned that today. Forged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you've heard you've heard that one, have you? Right. I've yeah, yeah. That one. yeah. Yes, I've, I've heard that. One. I've sold all mine. <laughs> <laughs> I've sold the ones he gave to me. <laughs> Andrew, thanks for your time. Great talking to you. Take care of yourself. Not at all. Nice to speak to you. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Bye. We got there from England captain to hiding away to being a happy bloke <laughs> again. We got there. Yes. There's a, there's a theme, Will. There is a theme that runs through all your stories. And it's kind of surprised me from the character I, I saw leading the anthems at Twickenham. You're quite self-deprecating. I think a lot a lot has been made of things that I, d- I don't believe genuinely I, I should take a huge amount of credit for. I think a lot of the time I've been lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of the people that have, have, have delivered all around me. And you sort of think I, I'm just not comfortable with taking credit for stuff that I don't genuinely believe I've delivered on. So it's not a sort of false modesty of, <laughs> you know what, I am pretty special. It's just, I don't think I am. I think, uh, you know, I, I did okay and I did some things well and I, and I worked pretty hard at certain things, but like the, I was lucky to be around it with some pretty special characters and other bits and pieces that you think, oh, bloody hell, yeah, I'm grateful for that. Uh, those who follow you on Twitter will know and Instagram know how self-deprecation you are these days. There's a lovely story and I'll let you tell it. But just to give the background, uh, you do mentor the England players at the moment. You go into camp and help out Eddie Jones. And that involves you maybe sticking on the England kit now and again. And uh, <laughs> as you go in there, I'm going to let you pick up the story as Will <laughs> Carling, fully kitted out, reaches yeah. a petrol station on the way home. No, it was, it was on the way in. So I'd get up earlier. So I put on the stuff, you know, which is obviously branded short it's socks it's top it's it's the full so i get in the car and i get in i look at the dial it's like oh you anyway so i think right i've got to fill it up on the way in so i stop at the petrol station and it was pretty cold i'm filling it up standing there in my kit and it was just brilliant because this guy w- walks past and then sort of looks does a double take and, and then just looks me up and down and goes uh bit sad will and i sort of looked at him and he went mate it's over move on 
laughs and walks in to pay for his petrol. And I'm standing there and I just look at the kit and I'm like, oh God. And I, I just sort of, you know, you sort of think you're about to try and explain and go, oh no, there's, there's just no point. And um, so I put that on Twitter and I told the guys when I got in and they killed themselves laughing. Um, just they absolutely loved it because it just was, you know, you sad man, you put that on every day. <laughs> <laughs> it was just brilliant. I want to end on, on a real a real positive. It's a lovely story, this. It just shows how much empathy you have, maybe from your experiences in life and how empathetic he can be. But during lockdown, obviously a very, very difficult time for a lot of people. You were put in touch or you're told about a lady called Joan Hogwell. Joan's in her 80s, was struggling with loneliness, obviously, during lockdown, wasn't able to see her family. And this got to you and you knew she was a rugby fan. She was a Will Carling fan, but mainly an England rugby fan. And you decided to send her a message. And this is the message you sent on social media to Joan. And we'll talk about the effects it had on people after. But let's have a listen to this. Hi, Joan. Your grandson, Pete, asked if I'd do a little video for you to try and get your spirits up. Apparently, you're a massive rugby fan. And uh, you're a little bit down at a fall, a bit of a cancer scare. But you're over them all now. So I just thought I'd ask a few really good players to send you a few messages and hope this cheers you up. Hi, Joan. It's Johnny May here. I just wanted to send you a message to hope that you're safe and well at home and just to say take care. A message for Joan. It's Phil Vickery here. I know you're a big rugby fan. I just wanted you to know that I'm thinking of you and wishing you well and please keep safe and sound. Well, that's such a lovely message. It really is. And uh, Joan is busy today, so she couldn't come on the line. She's a busy lady, but she did want to send this message back to you. So this is Joan to you, Will. Hi, Will. Hope you are well. It's Joan here. I just wanted to say a massive thank you to you for taking the time to send me that lovely message back at the beginning of lockdown. I was so surprised and excited to get a message from one of my favourite ever rugby players. It was also brilliant to see the messages from all the other guys as well. You really lifted my spirits. It was a special thing to do. So thank you so much. Now that is sweet. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing though, the effect you can have on people, you know. I mean, I know you're kind of, you're, you are self-deprecating, but uh, you will always be seen as one of the greatest in an England shirt. And that's the effect you can have on people. It's quite a powerful thing. Uh. Well, I think during lockdown, I, I just felt that, you know, you, you're lucky enough to have access to, to rugby guys past and, and, and present. And if they can take 30 seconds and, and get a message to someone, it makes a huge difference. And I just, so I made a bit of an effort for that because one thing maybe you learn is, or for me, I've learned, I've been lucky enough to meet, you know, some, some very special people uh, and from all different parts of life. I think that the key bit that, that I really love is, you know, is when people look after each other. And that's what I love. And you sent that message to lots of other people. And the effect has been absolutely brilliant and hugely positive. So, so fair play to you. Thank you for being so honest and reliving some of the, the, the highs and some of the lows with us today. It's been, it's been really great. Thanks for your, your trust and your honesty on that. Oh, no. Do you know what, Craig? It's been, it's been really great. It's been slightly unnerving listening to mates come on. But uh, no, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you. Not at all. Really good. Thanks, Will. Take care of yourself. All the best. Bye -bye. And you. Well, amazing the things you learn about people when you get their friends involved. I certainly learned a lot more about Will Carlin's career and his life. I hope you did too. Today's show was produced by Keith Doyle by Three Rock Productions for Audi. Please do subscribe and share the contact book and check out all the other amazing guests who have opened up their contact book to me. Take care of yourselves and bye-bye. <laughs>